Good morning, and thank you all for holding. Your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion of today's conference. I would like to remind all parties the call is now being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. And I would now like to turn the call over to Carrie Barrett. Thank you. You may begin. Hey, thank you so much. Good morning, and thanks to everyone for joining us for today's FISMA webinar on the Foreign Supplier Verification Program and Accreditation of Third-Party Auditors' Final Rules. As mentioned, my name is Carrie Barrett, and I serve on the FDA Foods and Veterinary Medicine Strategic Communications and Public Engagement Team, and I will moderate this morning's call. Today's call is for our external FISMA stakeholders who are interested in further understanding the final rule of both Foreign Supplier Verification, or FSVP, as well as accreditation of third-party auditors' final rule. Today we're going to have three speakers. We're going to start with Sharon Mayo, who is a Senior Advisor for Policy, FDA's Office of Foods and Veterinary Medicine. And Sharon will cover the new import paradigm under FISMA. We'll then turn to our main subject expert on FSVP, which is Brian Pendleton. He's a Senior Policy Advisor, FDA Office of Policy. And Brian will walk through significant provisions of the final FSVP rule. When he concludes, Charlotte Christen, our Senior Policy Advisor, FDA Office of Foods and Veterinary Medicine, and our lead subject matter expert on accreditation of third-party auditors, will cover the significant provisions of that final rule. And then at that point, we will open the webinar up for questions and answers, and the operator will come back on and provide instructions um, for how to ask a question at that time. But now let's turn to the program, and we'll have Sharon mail begin. Sharon? Thank you, Carrie, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. In a few minutes, you'll hear more about the FSCP and third-party rules. But I want to take a few minutes and put those rules into perspective. FSCP and third party, along with the preventive controls rules for human food and animal food, which were issued in September of this year, the produce safety rule, which was issued in November, and the intentional adulteration and sanitary transport rules, which will be issued next year, will build FDA's new food, port, new food safety system. Together, these rules create a new food safety paradigm that focuses on prevention of food safety problems rather than reacting to them after they occur. It recognizes the role that industry has in uh, producing and importing safe food and gives us the tools to hold the industry accountable for meeting their obligations. FSCP and third parties are two uh, new parts of uh, our, the FISMA import programs that will help us transform the way we regulate imports as well. In many ways, the FSCP rule is the biggest game changer because for the first time, we're able to hold importers accountable for taking preventive measures to ensure that suppliers produce food consistent with U.S. safety standards. We know that you, uh, FSCP is a mandatory program and will require inspections of domestic importers. Third party, as you will hear, is a voluntary program that will play a role in the voluntary qualified importer program and in import certification which is a new FISMA tool that will allow us to require certification in certain instances as a condition of entry if certain statutory criteria are met. It's important to note that even though these programs play a significant role in ensuring the safety of imported foods, they are only part of a larger toolkit that helps to ensure that foods produced in other countries are held to the same safety standards as foods produced in the U.S. And to that end, I should note that we will continue to do foreign inspections of foreign suppliers. We will continue to examine and sample foods at the ports of entry and make individual admissibility decisions. We will continue to use existing tools, such as PREDICT and import alerts, that help us to better screen imported foods. We'll continue to operate a prior notice system, and we'll continue our efforts for capacity building for foreign governments and industry, as well as to engage in bilateral and multilateral international agreements with our trading partners. The new FISMA imports programs and activities will, no, will need to be integrated with these existing import activities, as well as the other FISMA programs, in a way that transforms our overall import program into one that focuses on prevention and puts primary responsibility for the safety of imports on industry. 
Accomplishing this will not only involve working with industry through education and outreach to bring about compliance, but also rethinking the way we do business here at the agency, which includes training our own personnel and ensuring our resources are allocated in an effective and efficient manner to best target risk. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian to tell you about the key provisions of the FSCP rule. Thanks, Sharon, and thanks to everyone for the opportunity to talk with you today about FDA's final rule on food importers' point fire verification programs. The FSCP regulation will, will play an important role in the risk-based prevention-oriented approach to food safety that FDA is established, establishing that's consistent with this one. FSCP is truly significant because for the first time, uh, it requires importers to take specific steps to ensure the safety of the food they import. In FINRA, Congress required food importers to perform risk-based foreign supply verification activities and it directed FDA to adopt regulations on the content of those FSVPs. We issued the proposal on FSVPs in 2013 and last year we issued a supplemental proposal that included several changes in response to some of the more than 300 comments that we received from stakeholders. And after considering the further comments on the supplemental proposal, we finalized the rule on November 13th and that's expected to be published on Friday in the Federal Register. As I said earlier, the final rule will, for the first time, require most importers to take responsibility for ensuring the safety of the food they import. Uh, consistent with our other business rules, FSVP is designed to be risk-based because it takes into account different types of hazards, importers, and foreign suppliers. As I'll discuss in more detail later, the rule gives importers flexibility in meeting the requirements to accommodate modern global supply chains by allowing importers to rely on activities that are conducted by other entities. And the, the final rule is very closely aligned with the supply chain provisions in the Preventive Controls Regulations to avoid imposing redundant uh, requirements on importers that are also food facilities in the, in the United States and to ensure a level playing field for domestic and foreign suppliers. The regulation, uh, consistent with the statute, requires importers to develop FSVPs to provide assurances that their foreign suppliers are using processes and procedures that provide at least the same level of public health protection as those that are required under the Preventive Controls, or PC, and the Produce Safety Provisions of FISMA, and the implementing regulations that we uh, recently issued. This standard allows flexibility consistent with our trade obligations for a foreign supplier to use a different procedure than specifically required under the PC or produce safety regulations if it uh, provides the same level of public health protection. FSVPs uh, for uh, importers also need to be able to provide assurance that the foreign supplier's food isn't adulterated and isn't misbranded with, uh, with respect to allergen labeling. Who needs to comply with FSVP? Under the rule, the, the importer of a food must be somebody in the United States who takes responsibility for the safety of the food. The importer is the U.S. owner or consignee of the food at the time of entry of the food into the United States. The regulation also, also defines U.S. owner or consignee as the person in the United States who, at the time of entry, either owns the food, has purchased it, or has agreed in writing to purchase it. If there isn't a U.S. owner or consignee at the time of entry, the FSVP importer is the U.S. agent or representative of the foreign owner or consignee. And the final rule makes clear that there must be a signed statement of consent for the person designated as the U.S. agent or representative to serve as the FSVP importer for the investigation to be valid. As we noted in the proposed rule, the importer on the food for FSVP purposes could be, but isn't necessarily the importer of record for purposes of submitting uh, entry with uh, customs and, and border protection. That person, who might be a customs broker or a filer, might not always be a person with a financial interest in the food or have the knowledge and ability to conduct supply and verification. I want to talk about some of the exemptions from the FSVP requirements, um, some of which we added in the final rule itself. Importers of juice and seafood. Uh, made in compliance with the HACCP regulations uh, are exempt because those importers are already subject to certain verification requirements under the HACCP regulations. And the final rule clarifies that firms importing juice or seafood raw materials or other ingredients for use in making juice or seafood products under the HACCP regulations in the United States are also exempt. Other exemptions include food used for research or evaluation, 
food that's imported for personal consumption, alcoholic beverages, and uh, raw materials used in making alcoholic beverages. And a few other exemptions that we have are uh, for food that's transshipped through the United States to another country, food that is imported for processing and then future export, food that's produced in the United States, exported and returned here without uh, further manufacturing and processing, and meats, poultry, and egg products that are subject to regulation by USDA at the time of importation. In the final rule, we aligned FSVP with the PC supply chain program provisions even more closely than we had in the supplemental notice uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, first, by revising the hazard analysis and supplier verification provisions so that they are the same to the extent possible and appropriate. And then we broaden the circumstances under which an importer who is in compliance with preventive controls is deemed to be in compliance with most of the FSVP requirements. So, an importer that's a food facility is deemed in compliance with FSVP except for the requirement to ensure that it is identified as the FSVP importer at, at entry in three cases. When it has a supply chain program for the raw material or other ingredient it, it imports. When it implements a preventive control for the food that it imports consistent with the preventive controls regulations. And when it's not required to implement a preventive control for a food because its customer or a subsequent entity in US, U.S. distribution is addressing the hazards in the food, or in some cases when the importer has determined that the food can't be consumed without the application of the control. And I'll talk about uh, parallel provisions that we have uh, for these in the FSVC regulation uh, later. We made some changes in the final rule to the requirements concerning the use of qualified individuals to perform FSVC tasks. We provided more flexibility by stating that a qualified individual is someone who has the education, training, or experience, or, or a combination of those factors that's necessary to perform a particular FSVP activity. The definition also states that a qualified individual might be, but doesn't have to be, an employee of the importer, and a qualified indi individual could be a government employee, including a foreign government, government employee. Uh, note also that the individual needs to be qualified to do the specific activity he or she is performing, and the qualifications might vary. For example, a person who is conducting ha hazard analysis for an importer uh, needs different qualifications than a person who is maintaining records. Also, uh, rather than require that all FSVP records be maintained in English, the regulation requires that a qualified individual be able to understand the language of any records he or she is reviewing as part of their FSVP responsibility. And uh, we also added a, a requirement that FCA may request translation of records. Importers will be required to analyze the hazards in the food, foods they import. Specifically, they'll need to look at the biological, chemical, and physical hazards that are known or reasonably foreseeable to determine whether they require a control. And this is a little bit different from the proposal in which we said that uh, importers need to determine whether hazards are significant. Importers also need to consider those hazards that occur naturally, that may be un unintentionally introduced, or might be intentionally introduced for purposes of economic gain. The final rule builds more flexibility into the hazard analysis provisions by allowing an importer to rely not just on a hazard analysis conducted by a foreign supplier, as we had included in the proposal, but on an al analysis conducted by another entity, such as a consolidator of raw agricultural commodities, or an industry association who wants to take on the task of performing a hazard analysis, uh, provided that the importer reviews and assesses the analysis that, that it obtains. If there aren't any hazards that require a control, the importer doesn't have to evaluate the foreign supplier's performance or the risk posed by a food, which I'll talk about in a minute, and, and doesn't have to determine and conduct supplier verification. And the final rule uh, includes uh, several types of foods for which an importer might find that there aren't any hazards that require a control, including crackers, dried pasta, cookies, candy, sugar, soft drinks, jams, and, and jellies. In alignment with the PC supply chain provisions, FSVP requires importers to consider certain characteristics of a potential foreign supplier and the risk posed by a food in approving their suppliers and then determining appropriate verification activities. In addition to the hazard analysis for the food, the importer must consider the entity that's going to be significantly minimizing or preventing a hazard or verifying that a hazard has been 
significantly minimized or prevented. They must look at the foreign suppliers' food safety processes, procedures, and practices. They'll need to consider the, the FDA food safety regulations that apply to the food and the foreign suppliers' compliance with those regulations. For example, whether the supplier has been a subject of a warning letter or an import alert. And importers also need to look at food safety information, such as the supplier's record of meeting their customers' expectations when assessed through uh, methods such as auditing or testing. The final rule requires that importers reevaluate the foreign supplier and the risk posed by the food when they become aware of new information about the factors that I just mentioned, or at least every three years. And finally, as with hazard analysis, importers may rely on a food and supplier evaluation that has been conducted by another entity. In addition to supplier verification, such as on-site auditing or records review, which I'll talk about in a moment, the rule requires importers to conduct uh, certain related activities related to verification, that is, importers need to establish and follow procedures such as uh, use of some type of electronic database to ensure that they are receiving food from the suppliers that they have approved. But the rule also gives importers the flexibility to use unapproved suppliers if needed on a temporary basis when they subject the food to verification, such as by testing it. Um, use of unapproved suppliers might be appropriate when, for example, there's a, an environmental catastrophe in, in the region where a supplier is located. As with uh, several other requirements, an importer can rely on another entity to implement the procedures to ensure the receipt of food from approved suppliers if the importer assesses documentation of the use of those procedures. And another re related requirement is that importers need to have written procedures for their determination and performance of appropriate supplier ver verification procedures. Based on the food and the supplier evalu evaluation that is conducted, importers need to determine what verification activities to conduct and how frequently they should be conducted. And under the rule, possible activities uh, could include on-site auditing of foreign suppliers, sampling and testing the food, reviewing the foreign suppliers' food safety records, or some other measure that the importer has, de has determined to be appropriate. The regulation makes annual on-site auditing the defa default approach when there's a hazard in the food that can result in serious adverse health consequences or death to humans or animals. But, but here also there is flexibility for an importer to perform some other activity and or less frequent auditing uh, possibly if the importer can determine that that other activity provides adequate assurance of safety. As with the other, uh, several other requirements that I mentioned, the final rule gives importers the flexibility to rely on others to both perform, both determine and perform appropriate supplier verification activities. But whether the importer conducts the activities itself or relies on others, the importer must review and assess the results of those verification activities. And if the results don't provide adequate assurance that hazards are being controlled, the importer would need to take appropriate corrective action, which I'll discuss uh, in a moment. I wanted to mention one of the, the most important verification activities, uh, which is on-site auditing. And on-site audits that are relied on for FSVP purposes must be conducted by a qualified auditor, which is a person who has the education, training, or experience, or, or a combination of, of those factors that's necessary to perform on-site audits of foreign suppliers in accordance with the FSVP rule. A qualified auditor could be a government employee, including a foreign government employee, and it could be, but doesn't have to be, an audit agent of a certification body that's accredited under the third-party certification regulation that Charlotte will be talking about in just a, uh, a few moments. But if such an auditor conducts an audit that's solely for FSVP purposes, the audit isn't subject to the requirements of the third-party certification regulation, such as uh, the requirement to submit audit reports to FDA. An audit should consider any FDA regulations that apply to the food and include a, a review of the foreign supplier's food safety plan, if there is one. And if the supplier is in a country with a comparable or equivalent food safety system, which I'll talk about uh, further in a moment, the audit uh, should consider that country's relevant laws and regulations. There are provisions that state that importer, an importer may substitute the results of certain inspections for on-site audits if the inspection was conducted within one year of when the audit was required. 
Um, and these are inspections for compliance with FDA food safety regulations that are done by FDA, other federal agencies, or state, local, tribal, or territorial agencies, as well as inspections by food safety authorities in countries that have a comparable or equivalent food safety system. The final rule provides additional flexibility by not requiring food and supplier evaluation and supplier verification activities in certain circumstances when it's not necessary or relevant. And this includes when the importer determines that the food can't be consumed without the application of an appropriate control, such as, such as with coffee beans or cocoa beans. And foreign supplier evaluation and verification activities also aren't needed when the importer's customer or some subsequent entity in U.S. distribution significantly minimizes or prevents or otherwise addresses the hazard in the food. The requirements here vary slightly depending on whether the importer is subject to the PC regulations, but the importer would need to disclose that the food isn't processed to control a certain identified hazard and annually obtain written assurance from the customer uh, when the when the uh, customer is subject to PC that it is significantly minimizing or preventing the hazard, or when the customer isn't subject to PC, that it is making the food in accordance with applicable food safety requirements. In addition, an importer might rely on assurance from its customer that a subsequent entity will control a hazard. And finally, we built flexibility into these provisions by allowing importers to possibly establish and implement some other system that ensures control of hazards at a subsequent distribution step. The rule includes a few other requirements uh, with respect to corrective actions. If an importer learns that its foreign supplier isn't producing food consistent with the U.S. safety standards, the importer must take appropriate corrective actions. And this might mean working with the supplier to address the problem. In some cases, it might mean temporarily discontinuing use of the supplier until a problem is resolved. There is also the requirement in the final rule for, for each that for each line entry of food, the FSBP importer must ensure that its name, email address, and unique facility identifier recognized as acceptable by FDA is provided electronically to customs of entry. We anticipate uh, recognizing the Dunn and Bradstreet Data Universal Numbering System, or Dunn's number, as acceptable in the draft guidance on FSBP that we uh, plan to issue next year. With respect to record keeping, the, the rule requires that FSVP records be made available promptly to an authorized FTA representative for inspection and, copy, and copying. Off-site, off-site storage of records, records is permitted if the records can be provided on-site within 24 hours. In addition, FDA can request that importers send records to the agency electronically or through some other prompt means. I want to also note that importers can rely on records that are created for other purposes, for example, to comply with other regulations. If those records contain the information that's, that's required under FSVP, and importers can supplement existing records with other information to meet FSVP requirements. The final rule includes certain modified FSVP requirements for certain types of importers, uh, one of which is uh, dietary supplements. Um, there are special requirements that are tailored to importers of, of dietary supplements. First, most of the FSVP requirements wouldn't apply to importers of dietary supplements and dietary supplement components uh, who set specifications for components or packaging under the dietary supplement current good manufacturing practice regulations and then verify that those, those specifications are met. Other importers of dietary supplements that uh, um, other importers of dietary supplements will need to meet requirements that are similar to the standard requirements that I, that I just discussed, except that these importers aren't required to conduct hazard analysis, and the verification will be to provide assurance that the foreign supplier is using processes and procedures that provide the same level of public health protection as those required under the dietary supplement CGMP regulation. The regulation also includes modified provisions for very small importers and importers of food from certain small suppliers. In the final rule, we changed the definition of very small importer to align with the definition of very small business in the regulations on PP for human food and animal food. So for that an importer can have a very small can have very small status for human food, where there's there's a ceiling of one million dollars in annual sales averaged over a three-year period 
or animal food uh, with a ceiling there of $2.5 million or in you know, manual sales or both. The small form suppliers that are covered under these provisions uh, in, in alignment with the supply chain provisions in PC are qualified facilities under the preventive controls regulations. Certain small farms uh, that aren't co uh, covered farms under the produce safety regulations and producers with shell eggs with fewer than 3,000 laying down. For these modified requirements to, apl to apply, the importer will need to annually document its very small importer status or obtain assurance that its supplier meets the criteria as one of the small types of foreign suppliers. For very small importers and importers of food from small suppliers, the verification requires obtaining written assurance from the supplier, and it varies depending on the type of entity. For very small importers, they need to obtain assurance at least every two years that the supplier is producing food consistent with U.S. safety standards. If the importer supplier is a qualified facility, the importer must obtain assurance at least every two years that the supplier produces food in accordance with applicable food safety regulations. If the supplier grows produce and is in a covered farm under certain specified provisions of the produce safety regulation, the written assurance from the supplier must acknowledge that its food is subject to the adulteration provisions of the Federal Food, Federal food Drug and Cosmetic Act. And this same assurance is needed when the supplier is a shell egg producer with fewer than 3,000 laying hens. In addition to the written assurance requirements, there are some additional requirements that apply not to very small importers, but just to importers of food from small suppliers. They need to evaluate their supplier's history of compliance with FDA food safety regulations. They need to approve their suppliers based on, on that evaluation, and then have to follow procedures to ensure that they import food from approved suppliers. The last set of modified regulations I want to talk about are those for importers of certain food from countries with food safety systems that FDA has determined to be comparable or equivalent to ours. FDA has for several years now been developing a systems recognition initiative under which we conduct a comprehensive assessment of a country's food safety system to determine whether it provides a similar level of protection to that offered under the U.S. system and a similar level of oversight and monitoring. To date, we've entered into a systems recognition agreement with New Zealand and are conducting reviews of Canada and Australia. And we think that systems recognition will enable the agency to leverage the resources of other countries to make our efforts to ensure the safety of imported food more risk-based and efficient. Under the FSVP rules, certain types of food from foreign suppliers and countries whose food safety systems we have officially recognized as comparable or determined to be equivalent wouldn't be subject to most of the FSVP requirements if certain requirements are met. That's what we'll talk about in just a moment. But these modified provisions are limited to food that's not intended for further manufacturing or processing, including packaged food products and raw agricultural commodities that won't be commercially processed before consumption. This limitation aligns these provisions with the preventive control supply chain provisions which apply to domestic and imported raw materials and other ingredients, but not to food that won't be further processed. The requirements for uh, bringing in food under the, these modified provisions are that the supplier is in and under the oversight of a country with a comparable or equivalent food safety system. The food needs to be within the scope of the particular recognition or determination, and the foreign supplier has to be in good compliance standing with the food safety authority of the comparable or equivalent country as, uh, as uh, shown in the period on a list or any other type of designation that the that, uh, foreign food safety authority chooses. We recognize that importers will need, to, need time to familiarize themselves with the new requirements, so we build in time to comply. If the importer's foreign supplier is subject to preventive controls or produce safety regulations, the importer won't be required to comply with FSVP until six months after its supplier must comply with the underlying regulation. This might, however, result in several different FSVP compliance dates for importers, depending on the type of food they import and the size of their suppliers. We also realize that importers may need additional clarification on some of these requirements that I've just discussed, and we hope to issue as I said, a draft guidance in, in the first half of next year. In addition, we're working with the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance to develop training materials for industry on the FSVP regulation. 
And we'll also be hosting or participating in several other webinars and, and meetings to provide information on FSVP and other FISMA regulations. So we will be working closely with industry to help importers come into compliance with this rule. I want to note that you can find additional information on FSVP and other FISMA rulemakings um, uh, on our website. And there's a, there's a subscription information uh, feature there where you can uh, subscribe to to uh, information about FISMA, and uh, you can also conduct. Or you can also go to our website to find information on how to submit questions about FSVP and other uh, rules. And um, there's an online form for that. And those information, those questions are being addressed uh, even now with Florida uh, Controls and the, the FSVP and, and the other regulations that we we issued. Uh, recently through our technical assistance network. So with that, I'll turn it over to Charlotte. Thanks, Brian, and thank you everyone for joining us today. <clears throat> As the latest step in implementing the landmark FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, FDA is announcing the posting of the final rule establishing the framework of the accredited third-party certification program. Section 808 of the FD&C Act directs FDA to establish a program for accrediting third-party certification bodies, or CBs, to conduct food safety audits and issue certifications to foreign facilities and the human and animal food they produce. The third-party rule that went on public display on November 13, 2015, finalizes a proposed rule issued July 29, 2013. We received more than 150 comments on the proposed rule, including comments from accreditation bodies, certification bodies, the food industry, governments, public health organizations, advocacy groups, and individual consumers. We also received valuable input through dialogue during FISMA public meetings and outreach sessions. A few key points about the third-party rule. First, this is a voluntary program. Accreditation bodies, or ABs, and certification bodies, or CBs, are not compelled to participate. Foreign facilities that want to be certified under the program must have an audit that meets these requirements. The statute defines two types of food safety audits, consultative and regulatory audits under the program, and contains requirements relating to each. Based on comments, we have revised the final rule to clarify that a consultative audit under this program is one that is conducted in preparation for a regulatory audit for certification purposes. Other audits, such as the audits for uh, on-site supplier verification under the preventive control rules or foreign supplier verification regulations, are not covered by this rule even when the audits are conducted by certification bodies who participate in the third-party program. The audit criteria or standards under this rule are applicable to the food safety requirements of the FD&C Act and FDA regulations, which could include not only the applicable FISMA rules, but also any other applicable FDA regulations, such as seafood or juice HACCP. FDA is not requiring certification of every food imported into or offered for import into the U.S. The third-party program is targeted. Certifications issued under the program are used for two purposes. First, importers will use facility certifications from foreign suppliers in helping to establish their eligibility to participate, to participate in the expedited entry program called the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, or VQIP. Once an importer has been accepted into VQIP, he or she will gain expedited review and entry of food covered by the facility certification. I note that FDA issued the VQIP draft guidance earlier this year. We are considering the comments we received before we move to finalize it. Certifications also will be used in determining whether to admit certain imported food into the United States that the FDA has determined, based on statutory criteria, plays a food safety risk and must have a certification or other assurance as a condition of admissibility. The determination is based on a set of factors set out in Section 801Q of the FD&C Act. 
Factors include consideration of the capability of the regulatory system of the exporting nation to ensure compliance with U.S. safety standards for the food. I note that if the facility is high risk, such as for work planning purposes, that does not automatically make those products subject to import certification. Only if FDA makes a specific determination under Section 801Q will certi certification be required to satisfy a condition of admissibility. This slide offers a visual depiction of a third-party program. FDA will recognize accreditation bodies based on certain criteria such as competency and impartiality. The ABs will in turn accredit CBs who will perform food safety audits and issue certifications for foreign facilities and foods under specific programs. It is important to note that FDA will have oversight at all levels of the program, including the ability to withdraw accreditation from a CB regardless of whether the accreditation was granted by FDA or by an FDA-recognized AB. FDA does not need to wait for an AB to act before taking action against a problematic certification body. As in the proposed rule, we are allowing both public and private accreditation bodies to apply for recognition under our program. Based on comments, we modified our approach regarding the use of voluntary international consensus standards in particular those of the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. Under the final rule, we are specifying that an accreditation body may use documentation of its conformance with ISO IEC 17011 in establishing its qualifications for recognition. We recognize that some ISO requirements, such as those relating to confidentiality, may differ from our program requirements. Therefore, the rule indicates that some additional information may be necessary to demonstrate that all the criteria for recognition have been satisfied. At the time an accreditation body seeks recognition, it must demonstrate that it possesses adequate authority, such as the authority to suspend, withdraw, or reduce the scope of an accreditation. Competency and capacity. Generally speaking, having an adequate number of qualified assessors and adequate resources to sustain operations, and written procedures and programs for conflicts of interest, quality assurance, and records. The AB also must demonstrate that it can meet our program requirements if recognized. FDA can directly accredit certification bodies in limited circumstances that are described in the statute. That is, only if, after we have operated the program for two years, we have not identified and recognized an accreditation body to meet the program requirements. At that point, we may begin directly accrediting auditors. With direct accreditation, FDA will assume all responsibilities of an accreditation body. We believe this would be very resource intensive and as the statute provides, should be used only in limited circumstances. Therefore, we do not expect to use direct accreditation frequently. <clears throat> Foreign governments or agencies or any other third party may seek accreditation under our program. Foreign governments and agencies are assessed based on their food safety standards, systems, and programs. Other third parties are assessed on their internal systems, standards, and train the qualified audit agents to ensure that facilities and foods meet the requirements of the FDNC Act. Based on comments, we modified our approach regarding the use of relevant ISO standards, specifying in the final rule that a certification body may use documentation of its conformance with ISO IEC 17021 or 17065 in establishing its qualifications for accreditation. We recognize that some ISO requirements, such as those relating to confidentiality, may differ from our program requirements for certification bodies, Therefore, we indicate that some additional information may be necessary to demonstrate that all the criteria for accreditation have been satisfied. At the time the CD seeks accreditation, we propose to require that they demonstrate adequate authority, such as authority to grant, suspend, or withdraw certification. Competency and capacity. Generally speaking, having an adequate number of qualified audit agents and adequate resources to sustain operations and written procedures and programs for conflicts of interest, quality assurance, and records. 
We also propose to require that they demonstrate capability to meet our program requirements if accredited. We received many comments on the audit protocols, notification, reporting, and records requirements we proposed. Based on the comments, we made several changes to these provisions. For example, we removed the requirement to maintain records in English. Now, CBs will be able to maintain required records in another language as long as they provide an English translation within a reasonable time if requested by FDA. We were unable to accommodate some of the other changes that were suggested, such as dropping the requirement to notify FDA upon discovering a condition that could cause or contribute to a serious risk to public health. The notification requirement appears in the statute. Therefore, we maintained it in the final rule. However, we received several comments on the question of whether to require notification based on our Class 1 and Class 2 recall standards. The comments overwhelmingly rejected this idea and we did not incorporate it into the final rule. Rather, we maintained the standard that appears in the statute. We made some adjustments to the data elements we proposed to be included in audit reports, such as removing the requirement to submit recall information. However, we maintain the requirements relating to submission of regulatory audit reports and maintenance of consultative audit report records because those are statutory requirements. There are some related FDA actions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in June 2015, we posted uh, voluntary qualified importer program draft guidance. The draft guidance explains how VQIP would work and how importers could qualify for a program that would provide expedited entry of foods. In order to participate in the VQIP program, an importer must import foods from a facility certified by an accredited third-party certification body that participates in the FDA program. In July 2015, we issued model accreditation standards draft guidance. The draft guidance contains FDA's recommendations on the qualifications that, that third-party CDs and their agents should have to participate in their program. The model standards address areas such as education and experience. Also in July 2015, we issued a proposed rule establishing user fees for accreditation and certification bodies. FISMA requires that the third-party program be a user fee funded program that reimburses the agency for its work in establishing and administering the third-party certification program. We note that the third-party program will launch after the final user fee rule takes effect, and then accreditation bodies could begin to apply. Third-party certification bodies could seek accreditation after one or more FDA-recognized accreditation bodies begin accepting applications. For more information about this or any of the other FISMA rules, please visit the FDA website. You also may subscribe to a listserv that will keep you updated with uh, new FISMA activities. And to submit a question about FISMA, you can go to contact us or visit the FDA website on the FISMA webpage. Thank you for your time. All right. This is Carrie Barrett, and uh, operator, I think at this point we are ready to go to our question and answer session. Thank you, and on the audio portion, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, followed by one on your touchtone phone. You will be prompted to record your name, and please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Once again, to ask a question, please press star, followed by one. And once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one. And our first question today is from Michael Booth. Hi, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on something that came up in one of the first slides. It's the who must comply slide. I don't have the slide number, but something was said about um, uh, related to the definition of the U.S. owner, um, that it could be the entity that has agreed to purchase or will purchase the items offered for import. Could you just um, go over that one more time or clarify that a bit, please? Sure, sure Michael. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, uh, the, we have a, a, a 
specific definition uh, for U.S. owner or consignee, and that is the person in the United States who, at the time of entry of the food, either owns the food, has purchased it, or has agreed in writing to purchase it. So uh, that the U.S. owner or entity, if, if any of those three things have happened uh, at the time of entry, then that person would be the importer of the food for FSVP purposes. So if you if you don't own it, but you have agreed to purchase it, you would still have to comply? Yeah. If you have agreed in writing to purchase the food, uh, you would you would meet the definition of an importer under the, the final rule. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Bruce Silverglade. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And first, I'd like to compliment FDA on, on its excellent work in finalizing these rules and responding to the comments. Um, the specific question I have is, pertains actually to ZQIP, and um, at uh, OFW Law here, we are getting a number of questions about when ZQIP might be up and running, and I was wondering if anyone from FDA can provide a, uh, a guesstimate as to when that program will be, uh, when the applications for that program can start being accepted. Hi, this is uh, Dominic Viziano. Um Applications will probably be accepted in January of 2018, um, and the benefits could be kicked in in October 2018, fiscal year 2019. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question is from Judy Amaya. Hello. Um, I wanted to find out how a C CTPAT certified uh, product would fall under the foreign supplier verification rule. Do, do, do those being CTPAT certified, does that help um, comply so, with the foreign supplier verification rule? So it, it, it doesn't under the foreign supplier verification. It does assist in the participation of the voluntary qualified importer program. Um, so CTPAT is part of Customs and Border Protection requirements um, or a voluntary program under uh, under Customs and Border Protection, but it does not impact the Foreign Supply Verification Program. So, okay. So it, it, the fact that you're certified doesn't mean you're complying with the Foreign Supply Verification Program. That is correct. Uh, give more information to ensure that you're complying with the foreign supplier verification program. Correct. It's a this is, this is Brian. I mean, it's it's a it's a security program and not a food safety program, which is the uh, what the FSCP regulation is all about. So the 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 importer will will still need to, regardless of whether they are participating in CTPAT or not, they will still need to comply with the FSCP requirements to the extent that they apply to that particular food and importer under the FSCP regulation itself. And operator, this is um, Carrie Barrett. When we do have folks come on with a question, if you could state their name and also their organization, that would be very helpful. I apologize. Uh, my name is Judy, and I'm with uh, Chiquita Brands. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Michelle Buster from Forever Cheese. Hi. Um, thank you for conducting this today. I have two main questions, and forgive me if I've not understood some of the things you're saying to me. What I'm trying to figure out for the third-party authorization, because I've been conducting and having third-party authorization, is I don't understand the exact requirement whether I have, you know, people with their resumes, they are auditors, and they do BRC, IFS, and all of those. The type of third-party requirement, um, did you say it needs to be an ESO 17,000, or can I have a certain criteria that I give everybody to um, certify on, or does it need to be something like IFS, BRC, ISO 22,000? That's my first and very important one for me. Thank you so much for your question, Michelle. And, and um, so what we say in the rule is that someone can use um, documentation that they meet those ISO standards. 
in meeting our rule requirements that you do not have to meet those, you don't have to conform with those ISO standards as long as you meet the requirements of our rule. And so our rule includes um, information about requirements such as the uh, competency and capacity for the audit agents, how, what you must do to ensure that they are, you know, for example, objective and, and are able to um, demonstrate the independence needed to conduct an audit. So you will find the, the specific requirements for this program in the rules. You can use folks who uh, may be conducting audits under other programs uh, in order to to demonstrate that they, they meet our requirements, but you, they do not have to do that. And I take it that you're speaking um, as as if you were would be acting as an accredited or as a certification body. Is that are you thinking from the mindset of being a certification body yourself? No, I have um, in each country that I work with, mm -hmm. I have approved auditors who, for certain chains or whatever that I work with, have also looked over their credentials and seen what they do, and they're accredited to do different certifications. But my my question is twofold because I work with I'm a I import cheese. And I work with a lot of small people. So what the small pr uh, producer may be able to do or afford is not the same as a large producer. So I have different levels of, of way that people are being audited. And I, I'm trying to figure out what your minimum, maximum acceptance is for this so I know how to move forward. Um, because it's just not the same for a guy who makes three wheels a day as it is for somebody who makes 300 wheels a day. Sure. Understood. And, and I want to start with the... I, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe you're, you're thinking about um, foreign supplier verification program audits, the mandatory program, as opposed to the third-party certification program, which is voluntary and targeted. That's the one which um, results in certifications that are used for voluntary qualified imported program purposes or um, in the limited circumstances in which we require certification as a condition of admissibility. I was answering from that perspective. I think perhaps your question more so goes to Brian and requirements under the mandatory foreign supply verification program rules. I actually was asking about the non – I understand more about the third party than I wanted to ask one more time about the, the SSVP because I'm already doing third-party audits before you do it. It's just something I'm doing and I'm requiring from people. So continuing that guideline, if I'm doing them, and if that would be accepted, then knowing where it falls in. And then, yes, I am honestly a little bit um, more confused about the FSSVP because I'm sort of doing things, but I'm wondering is it that I'm writing reports or that I'm – or is the FSVP that I'm getting reports from my producers or somebody looking at it, and then I'm just providing that for you? And is that every single time I import or is that once a year? Okay, thanks, Michelle, and I apologize if I've added confusion to um, what you were asking before, but again, the third-party program itself is very narrow, um, and an individual who conducts audits can become accredited under the program, but again, I think what you're really asking more about is Brian's program, so I'm going to let him answer this question. Okay, so, okay, Michelle, yes. so maybe Hi. I can, so the, as I mentioned, the, the on-site auditing, whether annual or otherwise, it could be a requirement or could be a, a verification activity that an importer could conduct or, as I mentioned, they could review the results of an audit that someone else conducts uh, to meet their FSVP requirements. The final rule does have some requirements about if you are going to conduct an on-site audit of your foreign supplier to meet your verification requirements about what that audit should be, uh, you need to use a qualified auditor. The, if the food is subject to uh, a food safety, FDA food safety regulation, the audit has to consider that regulation and also include a review of the supplier's food safety plan if they do have one. Uh, and then there are some requirements about the nature of the documentation that you have, need to have of that audit. But um, uh, other than that, it doesn't talk about um, the, the, the regulation itself, does not talk about whether uh, some particular existing audit schemes are are exactly uh, consistent with that or, or, or not. I mean, we, we talked in the preamble about uh, others, other schemes could be consistent with that if they, as I mentioned, 
uh, incorporate uh, a, re a review of the relevant FDA food safety regulations as part of that audit. Um, but um, that, uh, and we we are aware that I think uh, certain auditing schemes are taking our, our, the regulations into account and considering whether they want to revise their schemes to more directly address uh, the provisions in FSVP or, or preventive controls, for example. But um, I hope that helps answer your question about the nature of an audit that might re be required for FSVP. Um, to some degree, it definitely does, and I don't want to occupy too much time. Is there a way that I could, you know, just get a little bit more detailed with somebody by writing? Because I tried one time, and I, I know you're going to have a lot of different people writing you in the volume, but I didn't actually get an answer last time I wrote. Oh yeah, no, we, we, no, we yeah well we are receiving a lot of questions even on F S V P have received yes. but yes please do please do submit that with our um, technical assistance uh, our technical assistance network as, as Charlotte mentioned that will be uh, we already are handling uh, email uh, questions questions that are emailed to us about uh, the several regulations so I would encourage you to to take that opportunity to submit your question that way if if, if that, that might be able to provide more. Uh, more targeted uh, response. And, and the timeline for this is for cheese or food is 18 months or uh, when it's going into effect? For uh, FSVP. For FSVP. Uh, the, yes. An importer of, well, it would depend, I think, well, I guess cheese and wine made in accordance with preventive controls, right? So, so if, the, if the foreign supplier of the cheese is subject to preventive controls, then the importer of that cheese Generally, although the expense might, on, might depend on the size of the supplier, but it will be six months after the supplier is required to comply with the preventive controls regulation, for example. So a small supplier, if the importer is importing from a small supplier, it will have additional, uh, the importer will have additional time to verify compliance with the preventive controls regulation. So as Brian said, it, um, when the compliance date kicks in depends on the size um, and nature of the supplier. But when's your starting date? Uh, the earliest date is May of 2017. If, if, the, okay. if the supplier is a large uh, food processor. Okay, but there's time, so people. Okay. Yes, and we're going to be providing additional outreach and education materials um, on our website um, and through other means that help people understand both the compliance base and the requirements. Okay. There is time, but we know we we have a lot of work to do to help to help importers to understand. Okay and be able to comply, so uh, we, we will be very active in the coming months. Okay. I'll write you for actual details. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Our next question is from Donna Brown from the Nature Right Farms. Hello. Good morning. Um, the, my question is going to have to do with racks and produce, and it has to do with um, identification. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, we are, we're a marketing sales agency. We have four partners. Each of those four partners have their own names. All of them we import. Now, we use brokers, but as I understand, after reading the rule, I'm going to have a person in each one of those companies. Uh, let's, I'll just use Hortifruit as an example. They have uh, farms in Chile and Mexico. And so I'm going to have that one person there actually do the hazard analysis, that comes in through there, and then also have them um, uh, do the uh, verification using third-party audits that we already use. Um, so the DUNS number needs to be from the supplier, correct? No, the, the DUNS number that uh, needs to be, well, the, the, the unique facility identifier that the importer needs to, uh, it's the importer needs to assure that their own unique facility identifier is provided at entry, uh, along with their name and email address. It's the, it's the importer information, not the supplier, that's provided at entry. Okay, so that, what the, so, for Hortifruit, we have a, a company, there's people here located in the United States, it's called Hortifruit Import. And they're, they're actually, a, a bodies here. So anything that comes to an order fruit import within that supplier would be considered underneath that one DUNS number, even though there's about, you know, 300 farms in total that go to that. 
Uh, well, that, that, that could be. I mean, again, it 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 depends. It depends on who 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 is the importer. You you could have someone, and and this could a responsibility could be handled by uh, one corporate entity that is responsible for for uh, meeting the requirements for importers that are under that corporate entity. But but uh, the importer, uh, an entity that the company that meets the definition of importer is going to have to ensure that it's that, that information that I mentioned, name, email address, and, and unique facility identifier are provided. Um, they, 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 that, that one entity could be bringing food in through different ports, for example. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. but um, No, the reason I'm asking is because if, if something were to happen on one farm, does that then mean, and so if I'm using one Dunn's number, you said, because it's the one corporate entity that is going to be putting its unique identifier because they are the importer. Mm -hmm. They have, say, 300 different farms and locations supplying for that one importer. Right. So if one farm, something happens on one farm, is then everything that comes in from that one importer going to be stopped at the border? Okay. So, so uh, let me just uh, clarify one thing. When the compliance dates kick in for the uh, foreign supplier verification program, you're not really going to be seeing a change at the border. So this, hopefully this will alleviate some concerns. Um, except for the fact that they will have to, we will have to identify the, or you will have to identify who is taking responsibility under the FSBT rule. So that's a new data element that will be requested at entry. But there's not going to be sort of, you know, you, you can't anticipate that, that on, you know, in, in May of 2017, we're going to be stopping things at the border. The, the, the goods are going to continue to, grow, to flow over the, uh, the border in the same way that they do now, subject to sampling and testing if that's appropriate. The enforcement for this rule will be at the U.S. importer. So if we were, go, if we were going to inspect the FSCP importer, in the United States, and we did find a particular problem. We would work with that importer to try to resolve that problem. If necessary, we do have the ability to to stop uh, to stop shipments at the border, um, but we would be targeting our enforcement mechanism to address the food safety needs. So I would imagine if it's a problem with a single farm, it wouldn't affect other farms. But the FSCP importer would, would you know we would expect that FSCP importer to take corrective actions and demonstrate that they have control over their supply chain. But you're not going to see sort of a, a change at the border in May of 17. The, the, as I said, the, the enforcement mechanism for this rule will be at the uh, U.S. importer. And if we do find problems with FSAPs, we are, you know, particularly in the first couple of years, this is new to, to many importers. We'll be working with that importer to help them come into compliance. Obviously, if there's a food uh, safety problem that poses a risk to public health, we can uh, take action at the border um, just as we can now and certainly could um, in the future perhaps impose an import order or of some sort for a particular supplier in conjunction with that importer. But, again, you're not going to see a change at the first compliance state at the border other than uh, a request for additional data elements to identify those importers that are taking responsibility for FSCP. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. So just to reiterate and to make sure I understand, is that so each of the four partners that my company has, we are going to make them the responsible importer. They will look over all the verification activities, do the hazard analysis. And then if there is an issue with one farm, we would work with the FDA to just address and do corrective actions on that one farm. And the other products would still be able to come in because you would be working with that recognized importer, Correct. Yeah, that, that, that certainly is the goal. Obviously, if we, if we come across an importer who really is not doing what they're supposed to be, what, what they're supposed to be doing, not doing the correct hazard analysis, not doing an appropriate uh, supplier verification activity, then the problem becomes more serious with the importer. But I think that's not what, what you're asking. But, in, but the intention is obviously to take actions that protect, uh, protect uh, U.S. consumers from unsafe products. And our hope is to really, particularly in the first couple of years, you know, ease into compliance with this by um, providing uh, importers with, uh, with education materials and outreach and, and uh, resources to help them bring into compliance. But this is not a shipment-by-shipment -shipment enforcement mechanism. The enforcement mechanism for this rule really gets to um, the importer itself, and hopefully 
Um, okay. It is our intention to tailor those uh, enforcement and compliance actions uh, to the situation. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question is from Christopher Valadez from ORG California Fresh Fruit Association. Uh, good morning. Quick question. Does FSBP trigger or require any user fees associated with the audits that may occur under that rule of foreign facility? It, no. There, there, are, there are no user fees associated with FSBP or, or compliance with FSBP. Operator, we'll take our next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Levon Kusera from Caribou Coffee. Good morning. I have a question. There was a statement that was made regarding coffee um, and import in green coffee. Can you reiterate what that statement was in reference to? Oh, I, I mentioned that uh, that there uh, the the rule uh, contemplates that there could be some products uh, for which the importer might reasonably conclude that the the uh, the food cannot be consumed without the food being treated in a way that is going to address the hazard so that uh, it's uh, basically that the, the consumer can't eat the food unless it, it's not going to be an edible form unless it's treated some way that is going to control the hazard in the food and um, we received several comments uh, on this this issue and, and this concern, and we think for, for coffee beans and cocoa beans are two examples of foods that might fit that this category where that basically the, the, the beans can't be consumed unless they're going to be processed that, uh, in a way that's going to control the hazard. So in that case, the, if that is the case and the importer documents that, the, the, there will be no requirement to evaluate the food and the foreign supplier or to conduct uh, standard supplier verification activities. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Our, our next question is from Louis Mejia from University of Illinois, Champaign. Uh, good morning. Uh, Louis Mejia from the University of Illinois. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit or be more specific on that exemption of the uh, FSBP regarding, uh, and I quote, certain USDA uh, products like uh, meat and eggs and poultry? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Louis. Uh, the, the, yes, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there is an exemption for, for uh, Meat, poultry, and egg products products that at the time of importation are subject to regulation by USDA. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert enough on exactly those which type of products those are that are in fact subject to USDA regulation at the time of entry of the food. But if, if, the, if that's the nature of the product, then such products would be exempt from having to, or importers would be exempt, importers of those products would be exempt from having to comply with FSVP. Yeah, you know, that uh, particular point is very vague because, uh, well, even today, uh, as you know, uh, poultry, eggs, and meat are under USDA jurisdiction, and if a product has more than 3% meat, uh, again, into the USDA uh, jurisdiction. That that means that if I am importing meat, eggs, uh, or poultry, or a product that has more than 3% meat, I am exempted from SLDP? Yes. Um, I mean, that we the, the regulation cites specific requirements, uh, statutory provisions under which uh, the, the, the products uh, the, for example, the, the Federal Meat Inspection Act, the Poultry Products Inspection Act, and the Egg Products Inspection Act. If, if those, if the foods that I mentioned we discussed are subject to the requirements of USDA under under those particular acts at the time of of importation, then they, there would be an exemption. That's going to be a very large portion of the food that entered the United States. Then. That, will not be covered by FSVD. 
That's right, because they're subject to regulation uh, in a different manner under the USDA regulations. You know, the, the second question I have is uh, in regard to record keeping. I think I understood that the record keeping in a foreign country could be in the uh, language of the country. Uh, yeah. The next question is if it is in the language of the country, uh, if there is a inspection or a uh, requirement from FDA, uh, you would probably need to that to be translated, and within that, w within which period of time, that information should be available. And then the other thing, which is not clear to me, is uh, for how many years do you need to keep those records? Uh, uh, thanks. Very, very good question. The, the the regulation specifies that the translations, if, if the FDA asks for a translation, they it should be provided within a reasonable time, and we'll talk uh, in our draft guidance about, about what that should be. Of course, that would depend on the nature of the records that we want to be, with, are asking to be translated, um, and, and, and uh, the volume of those records. Um, and I should also note, as I said, that the, the importer needs to have the person that is looking at those records that are in some language other than English, that the, the importer, the, the qualified individual who is reviewing those records to meet some FSVP requirement needs to be able to understand those records, even if they are main, maintained in a, in a language other than English. Um, the, the, the final rule specifies that and gen, generally records have to, have to be kept for two years. So if you're, if you have an audit uh, results that you are relying on, you, you would need to keep those for generally for two years. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you are, have made, made a conclusion that you're going to do an on-site audit every third year, uh, then uh, you need to keep that audit, those audit results for uh, two years after that third year. So at two years after, you're no, no longer relying on those audit results because they're newer audit results that you have. But generally, the requirement is for, for two years, and then that's what the regulation specifies. Okay, operator, if we could have our next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is from Anna DeClaumann from Agricultural Counselor, Embassy of Denmark. Hello, this is Anna. I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is on the um, uh, slide, I think it was 15, but also further on you talked about equivalents and countries that had comparable food safety systems as uh, the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the process of comparable systems or equivalents, I would imagine that a lot of countries would like to be recognized in a situation with the Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, what are the chances that this is possible? I know that, that there is a process, as you mentioned, with Canada and Australia, but I also know that uh, it's a long process. So is, is this, I mean, is this realistic and how should it be uh, uh, approached from, uh, from countries? Um, I, I also anticipate that you envisage a country-by-country country, uh, process and not an EU recognition. Um, my second question is, uh, you mentioned on slide 25 that you are developing uh, FSVP guidelines. When will they be finished? Maybe they are, I just haven't seen them, but if you could advise on that. Uh, then my Third question is on government bodies as uh, as uh, a verifier for S, uh, FSVP and also third party audits. Is it correctly understood that a government body can be both both verify FSVP and also be a third party auditor? And in case it's a third party auditor, would it have to then be somehow audited by a private company? Um, yeah, and then finally, my fourth question is on dietary supplements. I think it's slide 18. Uh, you mentioned that most standard requirements do not apply to dietary supplements. Um, will the requirements be stricter, more specific, or they just don't apply? If you could elaborate a little bit on that as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for your questions, Anne, and I'll, I'll start with a couple of them. And I think 
maybe Sharon will, can help me with at least one. Uh, with respect to comparability, uh, yes, we, we have uh, a few years ago, we began this with our systems recognition initiative on, under which, as I mentioned, we do a comprehensive review of the food safety system uh, of, a, of a country as well as how they implement that system and their, their um, uh, oversight and enforcement scheme to to conclude uh, not that it's ex exact as the, as the FDA system, but that it provides a, a comparable level of assurance of food safety to to the, the U.S. system. And um, as I mentioned, uh, New Zealand is the only country thus far that we have officially entered into a systems recognition arrangement. But we are have, are reviewing the the uh, uh, the systems of, of some other countries. And, and and yes, we are talking with. EU officials about uh, about that process. Um, Sharon, I don't know if you uh, let, let me move on to. So, so, so just one question. I actually understood that you pretty clearly stated in the rules that you anticipated a country by country uh, process. So I, I, I read it as an EU recognition is really unrealistic. But I don't know if it's too political to talk about this on a webinar. But well, I, think, <laughs> I think that um, we need to move on because we have a lot of questions. But I, I think that you know, there are conversations going on between the EU and FDA, and that issue will be addressed in, in those conversations. Okay. Um, and with respect to the draft guidance, uh, yes, we are working on the FSVP draft guidance. It, it, no, it is not out yet, and we, 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 we plan to issue that sometime in the first half of next year, exactly when, we're not, not certain, but we, we know that that is very important on, and well, of course there, we will get more questions on some provisions than others, but, but we know that is a, a very important a tool that we're going to, to need, uh, to, to, uh, help employers, uh, understand how to comply, and we will, will of course be looking forward to the, the, the feedback and the comments that we receive on that draft guidance when we do issue it. Um, with respect to governments as, as verifying FSVP and third, um, yes, I mentioned that a uh, 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 government official could be a qualified individual or a qualified auditor that would be conducting uh, and could, that could conduct an audit, uh, an on-site audit of a foreign supplier on which a, an importer could rely, uh, provided that the audit was conducted consistent with the requirements, some of which I mentioned for on-site audits that are used for FSVP purposes. Um, and the, the dietary supplement provisions, uh, as I mentioned, there, there, are, there are some provisions for dietary supplement components uh, that are where, where uh, because the importer of, of those uh, establishes a specification for them and ensures that they are met, the, the, the importation of those components is not subject to the to FSVP generally. There are some requirements for, for dietary supplements, uh, for other dietary supplements that are similar to the standard requirements, but as I mentioned, for, for those products, the, the importer would not need to conduct hazard analysis, um, and, and, uh, the, the, the verification that the importer needs to conduct is that the uh, sub supplements were made in accordance with the dietary stuff and CGMPs rather than preventive controls or the produce safety regulations. Okay. Yes, operator, we will need to go on to the next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is from Kristen from GMA. Hi. Um, and this question is directed to Charlotte um, with regard to the third-party rule. So if, if I understand, just a clarifying question, if an mm -hmm. FDA-recognized certification body um, performs a consultative audit, um, and they um, find a condition that could contribute to a um, serious health issue. I know there's reporting requirements for regulatory audits under the third-party rule. Do those re same reporting requirements pertain to consultative audits for an FDA-recognized certification body? Yes, that is correct. The, the statute requires notification um, when that condition is found, either during a consultative or a regulatory audit conducted by a, a CB when they're conducting an audit under the program. Um, so, yes, you're right. But just to emphasize the, the 
point in this in the slide presentation, the scope of what is considered a consultative audit under this program is quite narrow. That is, it is an audit that meets certain criteria, most notably would be that it's an audit that is conducted in preparation for a regulatory audit for certification purposes. Um, they also have to be unannounced audits. So that dis those sorts of criteria distinguish consultative audits under this program from the much broader set of consultative audits that industry generally uses. Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Uh-huh. Thank okay. you. Our next question is from Marcelino Ocasio from FM Brown. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, if I'm buying an ingredient through a, a broker, I guess my understanding is that if I'm doing that, they will be responsible for the foreign ver supplier verification program. But is the FDA expecting that um, whatever all the ingredients are buying through them, they're following the, the program? Uh, thanks, Marcelino. Uh, thanks very much for your question. If I understand, um, again, the question or the issue as to who is responsible for FSVP, that, that's the, <clears throat> the U.S. owner or consignee at the time of entry. So it could be a broker, but it, 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 not necessarily. But, but assuming that it is, um, so, so yes, the, 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 the broker would need to, to comply with the FSVP requirements. Um, and now I've lost what, what the other aspect of the question you were asking with respect to that. It's mostly like if, if, if I'm doing it and I know they're responsible for, for that program, is the FDA requesting that every time I buy an ingredient from that broker, is, is the FDA expecting that I check on this broker to make sure that they are following the program? No, no, the, 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 the broker or whoever is the, the FSCP importer for the food is the is the entity that will be responsible for complying with the the FSCP regulation. And um, as I think Sharon mentioned, there there we will be inspecting the importers for compliance with FSVP once compliance is required in in a, a year and a half uh, is the earliest. Uh, but they, the we will be inspecting some importers who are who are subject to FSVP to see that they are in fact complying with FSVP, but, but there won't be a responsibility for the customer of an FSVP importer to check to see whether their uh, compliance, whether they're the importer from which they got the food is actually in compliance. There, there's some different requirements if the, if the, the importer is a, is a, a manufacturer and let, let me also say that right. If you're if you're if the importer if if a if a if a food facility obtains uh, raw materials or other ingredients and uses them to make a food, then there are the the as I mentioned the supply chain program provisions of preventive controls. So uh, whether whether the a raw material or ingredient is sourced domestically or for, from a uh, foreign country, the, those provisions would apply when a food facility is a receiving facility and needs to, to verify its raw materials or ingredients. So that could be a different question. Uh, again, that would happen not under FSVP, but, but, but under the PC regulations. All right. Thank you. Operator, I think we can take uh, one more question. Thank you. Our final question today is from Beth Gammons from Dollar General Corporation. Yes, good morning. Um, I was wondering if we uh, have in place, we're writing or having outstanding purchase orders. Would that constitute uh, ownership if we're not the importer of record? Um, thank you, Beth. Um, an outstanding purchase order. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I mean, the, the nature of what it means to be, um, sorry. Hi, Mrs. Dominic. It, it, it could be. Um, it depends upon who you who you're working with in terms of determining what the hazards are. So, because you're identified on the purchase order, you technically uh, could, could be the owner at that time. Um, and if you're qualified to do the hazards or identify the hazards, then you could be recognized as the importer for FSVP purposes. Yeah. Well, I just yeah. Thanks, Dominic. I just, yeah, we we. We, I think we'll need to talk about in, in our guidance what it means to be 
to have purchased the food or agreed in writing to purchase it. I, I would think that an outstanding purchase order in, in a written contract could, could meet that, would be consistent with that uh, an agreement in writing to purchase the food, which could make that entity uh, uh, the U.S. owner or company subject to the FSVP requirement, but uh, that's something that we'll need to look at in the in draft guidance. Yeah, and, and uh, this is Sharon. I just want to clarify one point. The importer of record may or may not be the, the FSVP importer. It really, again, depends on who is taking responsibility to identify themselves at the time of entry as the FSVP importer. And, and as Brian said, I think we do need to provide additional clarification on what some of these terms mean, but ultimately, um, those, those in the supply chain will be determining who it is. If, there is, if more than one person meets, meets some of these definitions, someone in that supply chain will determine who it is that will be identifying themselves as the FSCP importer, taking responsibility for the requirements under the FSCP regulation. So it, it's really um, going to be determined by those in the supply chain and not necessarily you know, us by looking at purchase orders or, or things like that. But again, you know, if, if more than one person meets the definition in the rule, um, it will be incumbent upon those in the supply chain to, to determine who's taking responsibility for these requirements. Okay, well, thank you, Sharon. And this is Carrie Barrett. We are at time now to um, conclude today's session on the Foreign Supplier Verification Program and accreditation of third-party auditors. Again, we want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this morning, we did have a, a little over 500 participants online, so we really uh, appreciate your time and interest. And uh, as mentioned, there will be a lot of work on our end to provide for their gu uh, guidance, and education, and outreach on these two final rules. Please remember that if you do have uh, specific questions, and we may not have gotten to all the questions today, that you can submit your questions through our FISMA website. Um, I believe that you have the link information that will be in the slides, which will be posted uh, to our technical assistance network. And that way your question in, uh, will go to a subject matter expert for a response. We would ask when you do submit questions to give as many specifics as you can to the situ situation that will help that subject matter expert in responding to you. Um, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we will be posting our slides uh, that we went through this morning on our FDA website, as well as the recording of today's session. So thank you all again for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, and this does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.